This is John Howell Essential Cuts, your daily rundown of the best of the best from today's show on 890 WLS. We have a lot to talk about with our next guest. He covers all things legal for Politico. He is their senior legal affairs reporter. And I want to start in Florida and then perhaps bounce a little north to D.C. And then time permitting, bounce out to my home state of Michigan. Let's welcome back to the program Josh Gerstein to talk about the ongoing Trump legal entanglements. Josh, welcome back. How are you, sir? I'm great, John. Good to hear from you again. Thanks for uh, joining us. Well, Eileen Cannon, the judge appointed by Trump, uh, she heard lengthy arguments, and I guess it got a bit heated yesterday, over when to start the criminal trial of Trump on charges that he hoarded the classified information, then obstructed a grand jury investigation. Defense lawyers, and I think they might have a point here, you're talking about 31 counts of willfully retaining national defense information, six counts of obstruction of justice, a lot of documents they seem to think they need until at least after the next election. Special counsel Jack Smith thinks they should begin, what, in September? That's probably not going to happen. Do you think she might just uh, split the difference and say, all right, next spring? Uh, it's possible, but, I mean, I, I think in a normal case, yes. Uh, I would think an aggressive timeline for a case of this nature, uh, meaning involving classified information and all the complexity around that, I would say about a year from the time of indictment. So uh, that would take us into like next May or or June. Uh, the problem with that, obviously, John, is that that is the, the heat of the presidential campaign, the end of the primary season, the beginning of the general election. And so um, basically any time from January through November of next year will be very, very complicated when you're talking about one of the defendants potentially being the Republican presidential uh, nominee. Well, not only that, but if he is elected, then that brings up a host of other issues constitutionally. Can he pardon himself? Can we put a sitting president on trial? I mean, this all should have been sorted out back during the Watergate era, but we kind of kicked the can down the road. Right. And the answers to those questions are unknown. Does a judge have the power to send somebody to jail who's currently serving as president? Uh, you know, could could uh, Trump, if he gets into office, simply direct the attorney general to, you know, uh, fire the special counsel, uh, you know, a la the Saturday night, so-called Saturday night massacre under Nixon and and then install somebody who would just ask the judge to dismiss the case, regardless of what stage it was at, even if perhaps a jury had convicted him by that point. So obviously, if Trump wins, you have all kinds of things. Injected, but assuming one wants to have a trial um, sometime in the next year or so, there really isn't a good time beyond sometime this fall or maybe into December. But but as you know, the the activity in Iowa, and New Hampshire, places like that, uh, you know, tends to pick up, get pretty strong, in even November and December. So there simply isn't a isn't a good time. And we have already one other criminal trial on Trump's schedule, which is next March on the Stormy Daniels-related charges up in New York. So that, too, is becoming a, kind of an orange cone that Judge Cannon has to steer around. You would think, what is it, Alvin Bragg, is that his name, the New York prosecutor, that yeah, he would just step aside? Concern. That That's such an old case and should have been brought years ago. He's really muddied the waters with that one, hasn't he? Yeah, I mean, there, there are many people who think that that's the strongest of the cases that Trump uh, is facing either the ones that have been brought already or ones that may be brought in the near future. But uh, I don't know. I don't know a lot of prosecutors that sort of gracefully step aside. Doesn't seem to be their MO. <laughs> Especially elected ones, right? Right. Yeah. yeah, I get that. So this is the simplest case. Now let's move to Jack Smith uh, with the uh, target letter that he sent Trump last Sunday, I guess, that uh, there's going to be some charges and indictment regarding January 6th. That seems tough to prove, at least to my layman mind, that did he yell fire in a crowded rally? And, I mean, he may have stirred up the crowd, but he was not there. That seems like a tough one to stick the landing on. Yeah, and, and I have to say it's murky exactly where Smith thinks Trump has sort of criminal uh, liability in connection with that episode. Is it is it what you're talking about of, sort of an incitement to riot? Uh, is it 
uh, somehow the interaction with Mike Pence. Some people have said, you know, Trump was told that that wasn't really a legal mechanism, a viable legal mechanism to get Pence to disregard the results. Then maybe what he was doing is sort of, you know, like going up to a judge outside his house and saying, here's how the verdict ought to come out in this case, which you're not allowed to do. So is that the theory uh, or is there something involving uh, the the so-called fake electors uh, or other schemes that have taken place in connection with the 2020 election? And, And can Jack Smith prove that Trump knew as much as other people did about that and sort of went through with them in bad faith, as opposed to many people appear, as we know, with Trump and give him sort of crazy ideas that he takes at face value. And it's hard to see how that, um, if a, somebody who has a law license comes to him and says, we should do this, um, how he, you can really argue that he should have known himself that that was illegal. That That's, I think, how Trump has gotten off the hook on a lot of things. And I don't see why it doesn't work for him in this. I, I think this is a, I think this is a tough case to make. You know, Jack Smith and I, we don't know what he's going to indict Trump on. But if he if it's that um, statute giving aid and comfort to insurrectionists, if they if they were I knew they were rioters. It's clear they were rioters. But if they were insurrectionists, they were the worst organized insurrection of all time. Josh? Yeah, well, yeah. I don't know that that statute is one of the ones listed in this target letter. So I know there's some speculation that that could be something that he's exploring, but we just don't know how it applies. It, it sounds like probably some theory involving obstruction of Congress's tally of the electoral votes. Uh, but exactly how Smith thinks he's going to get to a criminal charge there, I think we we don't know. And we probably won't know until we see some paper on this maybe Maybe next week, just another ho hum indictment of an of a former president uh, of the United States. Hi, well, Trump. Call that historic. We used to call that historic, John, but now we don't. Yeah, yeah. there's yeah. a lot of stuff that used to seem to be out of the ordinary that are just everyday occurrences now. Josh Gerstein is here, Politico's senior legal affairs reporter. Now, this seems like a clear cut case to me. Let me go. Let's jump over to Michigan, where the attorney general now has charged 16 GOP. Activists. There's a Wyoming uh, mayor that's a suburb of Grand Rapids involved in this. There's 16 who falsely claimed to be electors in a bid to aid Donald Trump uh, last fall. They wanted to obviously supplant the other electors, the Electoral College electors. This seems like an easy case to make because they signed a fraudulent document, period. End of story. Yeah, I mean, it seems like an easy case, although, again, you know, they may have defenses involving what. Uh, lawyers for the Republican Party told them. Um, And there is some history here that is kind of murky. There's at least one other episode in recent decades involving Hawaii, where you had electors sort of form up and form a rival slate. It be some action that would lead to them being certified. So if somebody told these people, well, you're signing this so that you'll be on standby in case we can win this case or that case in court, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, will jurors accept that that was the mentality when people signed this? Uh, that's what they had in mind, their their mens rea, or will they think, well, this was a scam from start to finish? Uh, the, uh, the attorney general up there, Dana Nessel, said there was no legitimate, you know, purpose for this at the time they signed these declarations in December that all reasonable challenges had already been exhausted. But we know Trump kept trying to slow down and interrupt the count until the day of January 6th itself, you know, about three weeks later. So so we'll see. We'll see if if these charges uh, go in front of a jury, if these 16 people, I imagine at least some of them will ask for a trial. And uh, this went on in a bunch of other states as well, John, and we've yet to see charges there. And we think this is something that Jack Smith has also been investigating. In fact, we know for a fact that at least in some states, he's been looking at these so-called fake elector schemes. What is Jack Smith's reputation in D.C. as far as his, uh, is he considered right of center, left of center? I've heard that he's just a hard-nosed prosecutor and has been so his entire career. I think that's what he's regarded as, sort of a, a generic uh, butt kicker, for lack of a better term, uh, that a uh, very tenacious prosecutor. Uh, You know, some of the cases he's gotten involved in have not worked out well for the Justice Department. Uh, He was 
uh, behind the prosecution of Senator Bob Menendez in mm-hmm. New Jersey, uh, which I think ended in a mistrial acquittal type uh, situation. He was behind the prosecution of Senator John Edwards, former Democratic presidential candidate uh, in North Carolina. I covered almost the entirety of that trial. Did not go well for the government. Ended with a hung jury and the case being dropped. So he has some had some outings that were not successful, but by and large, he's overseen a lot of the Justice Department's prosecution of corruption cases over a lengthy period of time. Then he went on to try war crimes uh, over in The Hague, uh, and he is regarded as very, very tough. And a lot of people think, well, you know, Attorney General Merrick Garland didn't need to give Jack Smith instructions. This is just his his nature, and putting somebody like that on this case uh, was a basic guarantee that Trump was going to be treated very, very aggressively and probably face multiple charges. Yeah, I, I think that's that's true, but I think that's a really tough case to make the the D.C. case, the January sixth case. Yeah, I think I think it's going to be more challenging than some of these other cases, the classified documents case, especially the obstruction of justice. Uh, component of that, I think, uh, is one where Trump has a very, very thin uh, road to follow that probably involves persuading people on the jury uh, that this is some kind of political uh, setup. I think in connection with January 6th, he has a lot of defenses and he has uh, potential arguments that could resonate with some judges in Washington uh, about, you know, people's speeches. And, you know, when you say you're mad mad as heck and you're going to fight uh, you're going to fight, fight, fight. Uh, there are many clips like that that can be pulled out from politicians of all stripes. So it has to be something more than that. And I think Jack Smith knows it has to be. And he must have some behind the scenes testimony, I would think, um, indicating that Trump's actions were in bad faith, that he told. And we've seen some of this reporting that he told some people during the course of this that he believed he had lost the election. And if that's the case, it paints his actions in that period in a different light than somebody who was going forward with a good faith belief that they had actually won the election and was trying to do whatever they could to contest it. I wonder in a moment of reflection, and I don't think Donald Trump has many moments of reflection, he's kind of glad now that the Secret Service didn't allow him to go to the Capitol that day. Uh, I mean, I think he's probably glad about that for a number of reasons. I'm not sure he's really the kind of guy that wants to be involved in hand-to-hand combat with uh, with that, with anybody. But I think you're right, John. He doesn't do a lot of reflecting. He mostly seems to traffic in grievance. That seems to be his main uh, mindset. So yeah. I, I don't think he does a lot of uh, uh, self-reflection. <laughs> I don't think there's a lot of long-term strategies involved. Josh Gerstein, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. We'll read more at Politico.com. Hope to have you back. Thank you. Take care, John. Take care. You're listening to John Howell, Essential Cuts, on 890 WLS. I talked to this next guest, uh, author, uh, when his book came out back in May. The book is called Country and Midwestern. And if you're a fan of a certain movie that I'm a big fan of, that rings a bell. Well, now, what can I get you, boys? You thirsty, you hungry, or you just driving through? Maybe like a beer or something a little harder? Hey, you know, we happen to make the state's best pepper steak. No, thank you, ma'am. We may be sucking back a few beers a little later on. We'll be here all night. You see, we're the band. <laughs> you are? Oh, gee, that is nice. Hey, Bob, this is the band. All right. Uh, what kind of music do you usually have here? Oh, we got both kinds. We got country and western. Yeah, country and midwestern. Mark, welcome back to WS. How are you, sir? <laughs> Hey, John. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Mark Moreno, correct? That's it. You yes. got it. Uh, journalist, author of Country and Mid- Midwestern's great book. has been out since May. Um, and tomorrow at the Harold Washington Library in the Pritzker Pavilion, the auditorium, we're having a very special, very special presentation. This is published by the University of Chicago Press. And tomorrow, what time tomorrow? Uh, it is at starts at 6 p.m. Okay. 6 p.m. Harold Washington. And you have a nice panel uh, discussing the Chicago heritage and Northwest Indiana included here. That's so important to country music, which is America's great art form, in my opinion. You know, if you take uh, uh, William Faulkner and distill it down into uh, four and a half minutes, you have great country music. So tell me who's joining you on stage tomorrow night, 6 p.m. at the Harold Washington Library. Sure. So j- journalist Monica Gang will be leading the conversation with me and we'll be having four musicians with us. Four 
really pioneering musicians, Greg Cahill and Mark Edelstein, who are the co-founders of Special Consensus, a bluegrass group that started in 1975, is still going. Mandolin uh, maestro uh, Don Sternberg and guitarist Chris Waltz, who are also at, at certain times also were in Special Consensus. So it's a reunion of all these guys on stage, and we'll be in conversation with them. And then they then I'll step aside. You don't want me on stage when they start playing, because then they'll be playing about a 50 minute set after oh. after the conversation. Did you say 15 or 50? 50. 50. Oh, that's nice. That's a nice. They're, they're, yeah. they're terrific. All those guys have worked with them. Previously on stages uh, in the old days, the before times. So, describe to my listeners, we talked about Patsy Montana, who used to work at this very radio station way back when, and other great country performers pre Grand Old Opry out of WSM in Nashville. Chicago uh, was one of the great cities, especially the uptown neighborhood, one of the great cities that uh, gave country music kind of its, its first break on 50,000 watts, even before Nashville with Patsy Montana in this station. And the significance of Uptown, just give my uh, listeners kind of a thumbnail sketch of why we're so culturally significant regarding country music. Sure. Well, starting with WLS, really, in 1924, you know, again, as you mentioned, for the really the first two decades or so throughout the Great Depression through World War II until about the late 40s, WLS really um, really created the blueprint for commercializing rural music, music from uh, rural America to the rest of America through radio that had never been done before. And uh, many of the stars of, on WLS were the first stars of country music. Um, there was the first publishing of these songs came from Chicago. And so the songs went out into the world. So now you can play them in your living room. So Chicago was really... The, uh, played a really pivotal role for introducing um, all of this music to to America, to itself. And, and um, It's because yeah. uh, the white rural migration to Chicago and the black rural migration to Chicago gave us country and blues. That's right. It's a, it's, Chicago was a magnet for all of these people, not just from the South, but from the Midwest, rural Midwest as well. Um, to come here for jobs. I mean, it was a practical reason why people came with them. But they, but then when they came, they brought their music with them. They brought their culture with them, and and it changed once it got here, and it sort of got shot out to the rest of the world. And in many ways, the music kind of stood up. It became adult when it came to Chicago, and it it um, and and then you know through radio and the recording studios that were here, the major labels were here, the publishing companies were here. It kind of got turned around and then sent back to the rest of the country. Now, tell me why uh, one guy in particular, maybe with his brother, maybe not, uh, came up to Hammond, Indiana. He was working in a refinery, refinery there back in the day and decided to uh, play a little ukulele. <laughs> yeah, the Monroe brothers, Bill Monroe, was considered the father of bluegrass music. I mean, he really modernized it, and he came up here in uh, 1929. Their father, he, would, he and his two brothers were from Kentucky, and they were working on the farm. Their father died. The family needed money. So like many other Southerners, they came here to work. And in their case, they came up to work the refineries in Whiting, Indiana. And it's a great story. You know, they, on Saturday nights, they'd go to Hammond, and they were big square dancers, and they would just be dancing and having fun. And a scout from WLS was in in the room, saw them. Apparently, they were great dancers, and he got them on WLS right after that. And they formed the Monroe Brothers and started performing around Chicago and Northwest Indiana for the first time. They had not written songs at that point. They were doing Carter family songs and other stuff, but they were, um, it was the start of their career. And Bill Monroe. He came back to Chicago then later with his seminal band that had uh, Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs in the, about 1945, I think 45, 47. And he recorded all of his seminal recordings in, in Chicago at the Wrigley Building. So many people don't realize that Blue Moon in Kentucky was not recorded in Kentucky. It was recorded on Michigan Avenue. I didn't so know that. It's, yeah, which yeah. is amazing. Yeah, to think about. And so... Um, so it was a really important place for him right at the start of his career and then uh, sort of midway through when he became a serious recording artist. A number of years ago, uh, I was emceeing at the Chicago Country Music Festival, Petrillo Banshell, and I was out there in front of Bill Monroe. And uh, I went out there and I was full of myself and thought, I'm going to educate this audience as to who Bill Monroe is and how significant he is. And I was prattling on 
And all of a sudden, the audience started uh, applauding, and I thought, wow, I'm killing it. They are just enjoying what I am saying. And uh, I hear a voice from behind me, and he says, son, you better stop talking because we're going to start playing. That sounds like Bill Monroe. I don't think he minced words. <laughs> no, no. He's like, you're done. Get off. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, I love the book, Country and Midwestern. And uh, tomorrow, Harold Washington uh, Library, the Pritzker Auditorium, 6 p.m. with great music. I know you're going to be talking about Bill Monroe, John Prine as well. So um, I wish you the very best. And then don't you have an event in Hammond next week as well? I do. So then this Saturday at Hammond, Saturday afternoon, starting at 2 o'clock in downtown Hammond at a great place called Paul Henry's Art Gallery, which is a century-old hardware store turned into an art gallery and music space. I'll be talking about, you know, Northwest Indiana's connection to country music, and a great songwriter named Dennis Lease is going to be joining me, and he'll perform afterwards then. And that's all free, and books will be available then as well. Did you just run into Dallas Wayne? Dallas Wayne, I saw him this winter. He was in town, and he was in a band with John Rice, um, mm. and uh, they played Martyrs. And then he also did New Year's Eve, I believe, at uh, Fitzgerald's with Robbie Folks. And, man, that guy is a great player and also a great storyteller. Great, and a, a hilarious guy. Great radio host, uh, and he played my band for a season. And uh, I always felt very... Uh, very intimidated at trying to sing after Dallas Wayne got done singing. Yeah, no, he's he's a classic singer. I mean, he's got just he's got pipes. He's yeah. great. He does. All right, well, thanks <laughs> uh thanks very much Mark. Appreciate it. Have a great event. Uh what is the website for people that want to know more? Is it countrymidwestern.com? That's it, countrymidwestern.com and has everything up there, how to order the book and all the info on the events as well. All right, terrific. Thanks for your uh, time. Much appreciated. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. This is John Howell Essential Cuts on 890 WLS. National news in D.C. today. I was catching this on C-SPAN because I wanted to take a little nappy-wappy. That does it every time. Uh, Biden's Competition Council, which has been around for a couple years apparently, they had a big day, and I'll get to that in just a couple seconds. But the people that are running Joe Biden's re-election campaign, which I still can't believe is happening, but... They did something quite clever. Marjorie Taylor Greene was down at a uh, conservative hootenanny uh, in Florida over the weekend, and she was uh, complaining about Joe Biden, not surprisingly, and comparing him to FDR. So the Biden people decided, okay, we can use that. Here's a brand-new campaign commercial for Joe Biden starring Marjorie Taylor Greene. Joe Biden had the largest public investment in social infrastructure and environmental programs that is actually finishing what FDR started, that LBJ expanded on, and Joe Biden is attempting to complete programs to address education, medical care, urban problems, rural poverty, transportation, Medicare, Medicaid, labor unions, and he still is working on it. And he tagged that by saying, and I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty creative. Pretty witty. So today, the president convened a meeting of his competition council, whatever that is, to announce a new series of actions by the administration to, A, increase competition in the American economy, B, lower prices for consumers, C, help entrepreneurs and small businesses thrive. Now let's get some uh, details from Ike Ajachi, who watches all day long in D.C., Ika, thanks so much for your time. I guess this uh, is all described nowadays as Bidenomics, yes? Essentially, it is. And one of the main parts of Bidenomics, according to the administration, is getting rid of these hidden junk fees. We've seen this administration tackle them in several sectors throughout the economy, whether it be the airline industry or even most recently the resale ticket industry and how President Biden and his administration managed to get rid of junk fees and surprise costs for things like Ticketmaster, SeatGeek, StubHub, what have you. Uh, Today, the Competition Council came together to uh, really try to get rid of these hidden junk fees in the apartments and and really try to make life a lot easier for renters. So today we saw the companies of Zillow, Apartments.com, and AffordableHousing.com really come out and, and say they're working with the 
uh, with the government. And essentially what these three companies are doing are creating a new website or new parts of their website that reveals to renters all the fees they could be charged when signing a lease. So Zillow, uh, the website will introduce a cost of renting summary tool on active apartment listings, which essentially allows renters to see the total cost of renting an apartment from the outset, including all monthly costs and one-time costs like security deposits and application fees. Apartments.com does something very similar, and AffordableHousing.com, what they're doing is requiring owners to disclose all refundable and non-refundable fees and charges up front in their listing. And the site will also introduce a trusted owner badge to identify owners who have a history of limit, limiting fees for prospective renters. So mm. we're seeing the, uh, this really start to take uh, uh, this co- council to take an extra step in this economy now looking to help seek relief for renters. I read someplace, Dan, one of the websites, there's new guidelines from the DOJ and the FTC to evaluate mergers between companies. Are they trying to change existing antitrust laws? Well, essentially what these new guidelines for corporate mergers, what they're what the administration says they're trying to do is disclose the junk fees charged by uh, you know, landlords and uh, not necessarily landlords, but uh how these some of these other companies are really trying to uh limit the concentration of industries in the ways that the Biden administration says to uh, lead to higher prices and apparently stymie the ability of startups to uh, to essentially grow. So the uh, Department of Justice and the FTC, uh, they're proposing these new guidelines that will want to provide clarity on how these mergers affect workers. And they also want to update the guidance for the digital economy that's shaped by big companies like Amazon, Apple, Alphabet, and Meta. But we're, we're seeing Republicans push back on this notion, uh, it's more specifically in terms of Twitter. They're accusing the FTC chair, Lena Khan, of harassing Twitter since it was acquired by Elon Musk. They say that her push to break up the concentration of corporate power it essentially amounts to government interference in business practices. But Khan says these interventions are needed because they're going to help enable more competition within the U.S. economy in ways that are positive for consumers, workers, and new businesses. But nonetheless, uh, them getting their hand in terms the Biden administration, rather, uh, getting their hand in terms of how companies do business, it's definitely starting to see some pushback from uh, from Republicans right now. And then one more thing, they're trying to promote competition between big ag, big agriculture. I mean, how many companies are involved in big agriculture? Is, is there is there more than one or two or three at this point? Well, there are, you know, you have your big names there, but a lot of it has to do with the farmers. So essentially the Department of Agriculture, they're going to have a partner with more than two dozen state attorneys general to investigate and sanction price gouging in the food sector. You know, it's the price gouging that puts the, that puts the small businesses, as in the small farmers and the, uh, you know, and the small agricultural businesses around. It puts them out of business, these price gouging. They can't compete with the, big, with the big businesses. The Biden administration wants to stop that so it can make more room for these small farmers to make a living. So essentially... What we're seeing them right now is also trying to get into the food industry. But again, the White House continues to say that all these ongoing measures that we're seeing right now, especially since the pandemic, they've led to more entrepreneurship. They're pointing to that figure, that 10.5 million applications to start new small businesses in 2021 and 2022. And they're saying that's the best two years on record. And they're using that as justification for these practices. Everybody wants to save the farmers. I saw the former president last night on Fox say he single-handedly saved the farmers of Iowa. Uh, interesting claim. Time to see the that one. <laughs> Ike, thanks uh, much for the update. Ike Ajachi, ABC News in D.C. Uh, we all love more competition. Thanks, Ike. Thanks for having me. Our country, we were respected. Three years ago, this country was respected. And Putin knew he couldn't do it. And President Xi of China knew he couldn't do it. You know, I gave Iowa and farm, farmers, the farm, farm states, $28 billion from China. $28 billion. That's why I said, you know, I go around. I don't want to be too uh, boisterous on this because you never know, right? But I said, there's no way I can lose Iowa and Nebraska, any of these states. There's no way because I gave the farmers $28 billion from China. No person, no president's ever gotten 10 cents from China. I got hundreds of billions of dollars 
and I went to the Secretary of Agriculture. How much has, I think they obviously got a check. But thank you. I love you too, I will tell you that. I think that that's what Hannity said, if I'm not mistaken. He said, thank you for fighting for us, Mr. President. Always remember, they are coming after me because I am fighting for you. That's what's happening. You're listening to John Howell, Essential Cuts, on 890 WLS. Both the Cubs and the White Sox contributed to a near record tying day for Major League Baseball. I guess the most runs scored in 129 years. So the Cubs and the Sox weren't the only teams involved. Major League Baseball had a night of offense, 130 years, almost 130 years, with 12 teams scored double digit runs. Three games ended 11 to 10, including the Sox when they lost to the Mets. 12 teams. Tied the 1884 record for the second most double-digit runs in one day. You know, baseball's all numbers, and baseball's all history, and baseball's all the history of numbers. The Cubs topped the scoring Tuesday night by routing Washington 17 to three. 17 to three. It'll be a long night for the bullpen now. The Cubs have gotten this thing back even. Bottom of the seventh underway, and it's Patrick Wisdom for Chicago. Patrick Wisdom has given the Cubs a 4-3 lead with a laser to left. So that was, when they say what inning that was? Well, they wound up winning 17-3. Atlanta or Arizona outlasted Atlanta 16-3. San Francisco beat Cincinnati. Kansas City beat Detroit 11-10, both. Uh, let's see. Uh, 10-3, Dodgers, Baltimore, Minnesota, Seattle, Cleveland beat Pittsburgh 10-1. You get the idea. San Diego uh, beat Toronto 9-1. to It was an extraordinary night of scoring in Major League Baseball. Now let's welcome back to Mike number 2, former EP of this program. Now he's moved into the news department. He's actually our de facto sports director, Brett Gogol, joining us. So you looked at this uh, all day long. Do we know exactly what happened? Do we know why? As a fan, I'm hoping it's because Rob Manfred decided to juice the baseballs again and make things a little bit more interesting. The realistic side of me says it's probably just an anomaly and you had a bunch of pitchers pitching on nice warm days and that led to a few extra baseballs leaving the ball yard. Could this be because of global warming? (laughs) Global warming causes MLB offense to to, uh, explode. Global warming will kill us all, but at least it'll make baseball more interesting. Well, that's probably the way that global warming opponents should go. See, it's a good thing we have global warming because now your baseball is more interesting. It certainly was interesting yesterday. I caught a little bit of that Cubs game. I was having dinner, a salad at a, at a restaurant. It was up on the screen. I couldn't really follow it, but I noticed there were some double digits up there. Yeah, they ended up putting up the highest output of the day with 17 runs. You mentioned the 12 teams with double digits. It's just something you don't, obviously, you don't see. You haven't seen it in well over 100 years. So for the Cubs to lead that, I think, is a nice little side note. And I think the White Sox helping in both directions helped a lot, too. Um, Are pitchers, is it too many mediocre pitchers nowadays? I would say you have a lot of really high-end top ace pitchers, and then you kind of get a cliff that falls off a little bit after that. But again, I I really do. I think yesterday was just an aberration. I don't think it had much to do with any specific circumstance other than maybe warmer weather. I don't think it was a bad set of pitchers going. It wasn't great lineups doing a lot of hard work. I think it was just one of those weird baseball days. How do you juice a baseball? Uh, From my understanding is you wind the... I don't know if it's twine or whatever that's inside the baseball. You just wind it tighter, and then it depends on how you store it pregame. So all the baseballs get stored ah. in humidors before the game. I know you know what humidors are. I do. Uh, so it depends on what you keep that at before the game. It usually depends on what ballpark you're at that they actually kind of enforce what the humidor is set for. But you can you can adjust that, and then if the baseball is wound tighter, it'll make the ball fly further. Do the umpires take care of the baseballs? I assume they do. They take care of them once they're in the game. Each ballpark has their own baseball attendant that's in charge of it that I believe the umpires oversee. Have the Astros ever been accused of cheating with the baseballs? 
No, I don't think any teams have ever been accused of cheating with the baseballs outside of a pitcher manipul- manipulating yeah, it. Yeah. So nothing pregame that you would think. Because, I mean, how are you going to do that unless you're going to bribe the umpire to only give out one set of specific baseballs to one pitcher? Every team, beach, both teams are going to be hitting it out of the yard if they try to juice the baseballs for one team. No, but if you're the Astros, you know, they've been caught cheating, obviously. Right. You just make sure the baseballs that aren't the long balls are being pitched to but your do, opponents. But, but how do you do that when the umpires have all the baseballs? You bribe the umpires. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's so, simple. There we go. <laughs> are the Cubs still selling? As of right now, I'd say yes. They're seven and a half games out. It's not out of the realm of possibility. You have 10 days, 11 days before the trade deadline comes up. If they were to go on a run and get themselves to within, let's say, four games, then Jed Hoyer has a reasonable response to say, okay, I'm not going to sell off Cody Bellinger and Marcus Stroman. Those are probably the two guys that they have that other teams would be interested in a lot. If they're within that range, I'd say, I don't know if they're necessarily buyers, but then they might play the wait and see game and just play the season out as is. Because at least you'd be going then into August on a hot streak and baseball is baseball and anything can happen. So as of right now, definitely sellers. If they can make up three, three and a half games over the next 10, 11 days, I'd say they're not selling anymore. Oh, on the south side, what happened to Giolito in New York? Just a total dud, basically the worst time possible for him if he's trying to get traded and for the team to get maximum value out of it. Smart front offices really won't hold that against him. They'll look at the underlying numbers and see that he's still pitching really well. Maybe just a bit of angst when you know it might be your last start with the team that you've been playing your whole major league career with, basically. And the Mets do have a pretty solid lineup most of days. So I would say not a big deal, but just, you know, it doesn't help. And that's <laughs> what, and the White Sox need all the help that they can get right now. I just thought of something. Uh, don't the umpires receive the balls from the home team's ball boy? I believe so, yeah. There you go. Yeah, you just, there have, you, you, go. you just get the home team ball boy to just bring out one set of baseballs. You have one set of baseball, you know, one set in one cooler. Another set in the other cooler or what have you, whatever. Probably a lot easier to bribe a ball boy instead of an umpire, too. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. That's how you do it. Well, you call up the Astros. Let them know. (laughs) I think the Astros are pretty well versed (laughs) in how to cheat. Uh, Thank you, Brett Gogol. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Don't try to strike everybody out. Strikeouts are boring. Besides that, they're fascists. Throw some ground balls. It's more democratic. John Howell, Essential Cuts. Check back every weekday for another episode of John Howell, Essential Cuts on 890 WLS.